All right, everyone, welcome back to our monthly interviews that we do. We try to bring leading experts in the field. Today, I have much more than a leading expert. So I'm going to take my glasses off for a second because I call him my better looking twin. So all of you guys can tell, you know, he's got the model cheekbones going and like the pearly whites. And here I got my, you know, my, my daughter every night. She, she asked me, she says, Daddy, did you put butter on your head? I'm like, no, it's just shiny. It's just the way it is. I get asked this. So Columbus, uh, Dr. Batiste, he is a friend, he is a colleague, he is a mentor, he's a teacher. You know, it's, it's um, amazing to see how much work you're doing in the community. I get to watch you just grow, blossom, and do all sorts of amazing things. So some of our guys don't know who you are, which is hard to believe since I think everybody knows you. So tell me, <laughs> tell me a little bit about who you are. Well, first, I'm someone who's humbled to be on this this show with you because you, sir, are actually the leader and you've done such phenomenal work within the organization of Kaiser Permanente and leading not only by example, but by deed and by sharing knowledge freely that's educated, literally, physicians. So, I mean, you fill that gap. I mean, there, there's someone told me this many years ago when I entered into leadership and they said, Columbus, listen. When there's a problem arises, a challenge arises, you need to be able to figure out the solution and deliver that. That really determines a leader, right? And so you've done that. We know that there's a huge problem in terms of understanding and education of, of healthcare professionals as it pertains to lifestyle and nutrition specifically. And so you've masterfully done a, a wonderful job in creating this series that you've created that educates physicians that now provides them the opportunity to deliver that to their patients. So you, sir, have touched literally <laughs> potentially hundreds of thousands of patients without you ever laying a stethoscope on them. That is a blessing beyond a blessing. And that's who you are to me. So I'm, I'm very appreciative in, my, in my, my job. I mean, just to be honored to, that's why I shaved my head. <laughs> Cause I wanted to be like you. I say because I wanted to be like you. But um, but for those of you, uh, for many of you out there who don't know who I am, I wouldn't expect you to. But I'm Columbus Batiste. I am uh, an interventional cardiologist um, inside the Cal Southern California area. I'm passionate about the heart. I'm passionate about our community. I'm passionate about leaving a mark before I leave this earth in terms of maybe impacting someone's life. And that's the reason why I think all of us do what we do, just trying to do whatever we can. So, so it's interesting, you know, interventional cardiology, explain what you do and, and at what stage of sort of the process of heart disease do you see these people? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So for those of you out there who don't know, so a cardiologist is someone who takes care of the heart, obviously. So cardio is in reference to the heart. And so one of the things that we identify is everything has to become so, so, so subspecialized. So I always kind of say colloquially, there's electricians of the heart, you have plumbers of the heart, and you have body and fender guys that are out there. Those, so the body and fender are heart failure doctors and our structural heart doctors. You have our electricians, our electrophysiologists deal with the electrical circuitry. And then you have your grunt uh, plumbers like myself that unclog pipes. And not to mention you have your general contractors who do a little bit of everything at times. So as a plumber, my job is not just to drop Drano down the, down the drain. My job is to go in. And so when someone is suffering with the effects of a blocked artery, uh, that may lead to chest discomfort, that may lead to heart dysfunction, and they come into the procedure lab that allows me to explore and identify the cause and decide whether or not how to implement the best treatment. Medications, placement of a stent, which is a wire mesh that props the vessel open, or whether or not we need to take a little bit more aggressive terms in terms of, of uh, open heart surgery or coronary artery bypass graft surgery. And so we do that not only for patients who are walking stable, but for also those in the throes of a major heart attack. So our job is to stop a major, the major throes of a heart attack when it's evolving in that particular moment. And so that's typically when I see patients as an interventional cardiologist, as a general, cardi a general contractor, when I'm there in clinic, I see a little bit of everyone. And so I may put a little, do a little bit of uh, everything at times in those few moments. So what, what is your approach when you see patients, you know, let's say they're not where the drain is clogged already, but they're heading that way. What are the things that you talk about personally with your patients? And more importantly, we know change is hard. 
So what do you do to help them in that journey to move forward? That's a great question. And, you know, part of the thing that I do, and I, I actually misled you folks. So I told you that there's three strategies to treat patients. I told you about medications. I told you about stents. And I told you about open heart surgery. One area that's oftentimes under discussed, except in forms like this, is the power of lifestyle. And the power of lifestyle has been shown continually in the form of exercise and nutrition to really stave off the progression of disease, right? So it's a misnomer of sense to say that someone who presents to me with new onset disease, when we know disease of the heart begins at an early age, in some instances, as early as age 10, if not before, and progresses throughout one's life at some level, we know that the majority of heart attacks, with this being Heart Health Month, not sure if it will air during Heart Health Month, but, but with Heart Health Month, we know the majority of heart attacks still occur from areas of blockage that every doctor would ignore. It's less than 50%. It would never show up on the EKG. It would never show up on a stress test. It would never, even during a, an angiogram, an invasive procedure, we would not treat it. Those are the areas that lead to a heart attack. So our job is to stabilize that area as much as possible. So as a physician, we typically will, a cardiologist will typically implement certain medications that have been shown to help maybe stabilize that inner lining called endothelium. But that also can be done through lifestyle. So when I talk to a patient and they come into my office, or let's say even better yet, when they're in the cath lab with me, one of the first things I talk to them are about, we, we explain what are called the risk and benefits of the case, right? And describe as far as the treatment options. So I make sure that I discuss the treatment options, which include lifestyle, medications, stenting, or open heart surgery. I put those in the context of really in terms of the severity of disease, in terms of their presentation, but never uh, mutually exclusive. So lifestyle intervention always needs to be a core component, but in some instances, it may be the primary and sole component. And so I do explain that to folks where they can understand. I also explain that our goal is always to, to start with the thing that's going to be the least harmful and then work our way up. So we start with lifestyle and get you moving, get you eating healthfully if, and while we're giving you medications and we adjust the dosing accordingly. If you fail that and there's nothing else we can do, then we move over to putting in stents. If you fail that, then we're moving over to open heart surgery. And folks kind of look at me and their eyes are, are wide and they're scared and they're saying, you mean saw open my chest? And then I said, well, we could also go aggressive with nutrition. You mean give up my meat? You mean give up my burgers and fries? And so on one hand, they're scared about the idea of open heart surgery. On the other hand, they're scared about making the transition. And so what my job is, is to, is to settle them down in both instances and let them know that we're there to help guide them and give them full resources to recovery. And, and looking at this stuff, so, you know, in my practice, what I find is, is a lot of my patients, they, they, it's not because they don't have access to information. And there was a time, at least for me growing up, I thought that, you know, it was really hard to find information and, and you really had to dig and you had to go to this thing called a library. And my kids have no idea because they've been closed for a year. But nowadays, every single person, if they have a camera, if they have a microphone, they can make themselves into an expert. And it's difficult because you can take one study and it doesn't matter if I wanted to say the earth is flat, I guarantee you I'll find that study. So when, when you see these patients and they have all of these preformed ideas and they think nutrition is so darn complicated, how do you help them to go down that journey? Especially yeah. folks that grew up, like I can tell you, when I was growing up, you know, we had 50 cents for the day and you could choose 50 cents for spending it on the bus or having lunch. And oftentimes it was walking all those miles from Compton to Gardena was quite a lot. So I would basically say, no, I'll take the bus ride and I'll skip the, the stuff. And then when I had food, Taco Bell was in Compton. We had Kentucky Fried Chicken. We had Burger King. And at those times, I mean, you could get so many tacos for a dollar. A dollar was you were a king. So looking back on all those times on how I kind of grew up here when we first came here uh, to America, and then when I was in Pakistan, forget about it because we grew up in a little village. All of those habits are so hard to change, but yes. change is possible. But how do you get started? Wow. You know, 
I was formulating my 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 thoughts to your question when you mentioned that you grew up in Compton. I grew up in Compton. <laughs> Yeah. I grew up, I'm straight out of Compton. I didn't know Dr. Hashby, you're straight out of Compton too as well. So you're talking I, about my old stomping grounds. I grew up in Gardena and okay. I stayed in Gardena. I went to school yes. at King Drew. So, yes. that, yep. so I, all of those guys, I knew very, very well. And yes. you know, all of the stuff that happened back when I was sort of, you know, in high school and that time, it was a very violent area. You know, now people don't realize Inglewood has million dollar homes and multi-million dollar homes. Yes. It's a beautiful, beautiful area in Gardena where we would have in Gardena where we would have drive-bys. We had, you know, homes that were considered to be meth houses where, you know, across the street from our house was a meth house. And so I came back from school. It was all blocked off choppers, a whole nine yards. Now you got SpaceX, which is two blocks away from us. And mm. you got all of this stuff. So, Entire neighbors are changing. What's not changing is the grocery stores, is the mm. access to higher quality foods. Yes. All of the terrible fast foods, they've gotten just more manipulative. Yes. Right? The menus have gotten more complex into understanding what is healthy and what is not. Yes. Yes. And that's why when we talk about change, I know people struggle, but I also know that what you do is you have this ability to reach people. And that's why I'm really curious to see is how do you help people to start that journey? No, that's, that's a great question. I appreciate that. You know, I'll tell you, it's hard. You have to meet people where they're at. You have to approach people with a level of empathy and a level of love to understand where they've been and their circumstances. I think it's the key. I think when you approach anyone with a sense of not only omniscient authority, right? You approach them like this and you speak down to them. That's the easiest and quickest way to lose them. So I think number first is I validate who they are and what and what they're what they're doing, their culture, right? And I'll tell you, and you know this, is that we can find healthy foods inside every culture. I can find health, healthy foods in every culture. That's not hard to do. So the first question I ask folks when they come into the office to see me, it doesn't matter their race, their creed, their gender, any of that sort, is I say, what are you eating for your health? I don't ask them what they're eating. I don't ask them what their diet is. You're gonna die from it. I don't, I don't ask any of that business. What are you eating for your health? And invariably they'll start to kind of go off on some diversion of to try to either impress me or either to tell me about uh, the particular dietary name that they're using or whatever else. And I'll ask them, what are you eating for your health? And so invariably we go back down to the basics, vegetables, and fruits and some degree of grains. And there may be dispute over this and that. And we begin to have a conversation. And I ask about, well, what's preventing? And so I never forget having a conversation with someone. And I, I'm not always like this. I mean, we're imperfect beings. We're, we're, we're trying to be better each day than what we were before. And I never forget one patient as I kind of went in and I was a little bit on my soapbox, kind of talking with him and his wife about what they should do. And I was talking more than I was listening. And at the end, he seemed enthralled and he said to me, you know, doc, I don't, I live in an apartment. We have cockroaches all around. For those of you who don't know what cockroaches are, those are these black bugs that are kind of big and very annoying and nothing kills them <laughs> at all. They love to go in the kitchen and crawl around, night crawlers and so forth. And so he said, I, have cockroach. I can't keep any of that stuff. And we began to talk as I sat there and my soul was crushed. Really, and I, and I tried to reach him and I said, listen, okay, here's what we're going to do. I completely shifted directions. I said, you know, at 99 cent store, I know you got it inside your neighborhood. I said, you're going to go there, go to the freezer section. You're going to get some frozen stuff is what I want you to get. I want you to get some canned beans. Don't get me the pork and beans. Get me the canned beans, right? And then what you're going to do is just enough that you're going to ever take out and you're going to put in the microwave and we're going to make a bowl. We're going to make a bowl. We're going to get frozen rice, boil in the bag rice, whatever we have to. And that way you're not worrying about cooking, you're meal prepping. And you're, I'm going to help teach you a way, use tortillas, use whatever, to make food that you can have that's going to be cost efficient, that's going to be health promoting, and still make you better off tomorrow than you are today. And so that's one of the things that I begin to try to do is to emphasize, focus on what you are, use that positive mindset instead of the negative. When you tell someone you can't, 
And I love this so much. I always give credit. I give credit to you when I give certain talks and I kind of glean things that the great uh, Dr. Hashmi has said. And so I had a guest on one of my, on my show um, that fortunately you're going to come on to as well uh, from England, Dr. Chidi. And so he said his Chidi method is he, he never tells anyone. And I tell people this too as well, if I didn't incorporate this, he says, I never tell them they can't. I'm not going to tell you you can't have something. I'm going to tell you to wait 30 minutes. You can have whatever you want, but you're just gonna choose to wait 30 minutes. And in that 30 minutes, you're going to go ahead and have an apple. You're going to have an orange. You're going to have something else while you're waiting. And if at the end of the 30 minutes, you still want whatever that thing is, go ahead. But what's likely to happen is that now all of a sudden by you eating something healthy and now you have the nutrients that you need that's going to embolden you to kind of put a wall up to enforce your willpower and help you. And so that's the issue of not resisting. And so those are some of the things that I try and tap into, into my patients and into those who kind of seek my, my, my help is really focusing on what you are eating for your health. What are you doing for your health on a day in a day out basis? And then using SMART goals, being very specific, not just saying I'm going to eat more vegetables, what, what kind of vegetables are you going to eat? Is it broccoli? Is it kale? Is it a red leaf lettuce? I mean, be very specific. Don't be just specific, but be measurable. How much are you going to eat? A whole head of lettuce, 12 ounces, half a cup, a quarter of a cup, cooked or raw? You know, be very specific. Outline everything, make a plan. Studies have shown that when you make a plan, the likelihood of you succeeding increases exponentially. Right. That's what stays. We, we know this, that there. So we want things that are achievable, that are relevant and a time base. We, I, don't, I don't set them on this time stamp forever and say, OK, I want you to eat uh, rabbit food for the rest of your life. No, I say, We're going to go ahead and let's just do it for for six weeks and let's see how you feel. If you feel worse, you tell me and I will buy you a steak. And eggs, okay, is what I'm saying. I said, you come back and you let me know. And so we put a specific timestamp on it. Is the, the other thing that what, what I attempt to do in this process in order to help kind of guide them and shift them and meeting them where they're at. You know, it's, it's fascinating hearing you talk. There was a study done and, and what they were looking for was they said, so we all have biases and people who are overweight or suffering from illnesses said, where do they, they get the most negative information and where do they get the most discrimination? It turns out that the number one place is your physician. So it turns out physicians are the most judgmental people when it comes to talking about their weight. They assume that everything is because the person is overweight and so forth. And then number two is their own loved ones, their own family members. So if you have the respected authority that you trust, and you have your inner circle of people that are supposed to be your blood relatives, and they're the closest thing to you, are the ones who are shaming you. It makes it really hard for you to have faith. And so this concept of meeting somebody where they're at, it's so powerful because we as physicians have so much power that we don't even realize. Our words impact people tremendously. And that's where what you're referring to is helping people to arrive at specific goals, smart goals, making sure that they're descriptive in their terms and not, you know, some cultures, for example, even in my culture, it's the same thing is we don't like to be disrespectful in front of a doctor. So if you told me, go eat five servings of vegetables, I would not walk out and never do a darn thing that you said. That's just, exactly. I don't want to sound disrespectful. I know I'm not going to do it, but all you said was eat more vegetables. But having a conversation, building that trust, I think it's so important. And that's why your approach, and that's why I wanted everybody to hear how you approach things, because I think it's very sensible, it's logical, and more importantly, believe it or not, it's evidence-based. This is exactly how you get people to change. You don't get people to change from the old school way, which is take a hammer and beat them till they decide to change. Exactly. Fascinating. Exactly. Yeah, no, we, 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 we absolutely have to respect people. I mean, one of the things is the fact that um, I think what's additionally important is someone just asked me this question earlier today <laughs> and they said, so what are your thoughts about diet X, which is contradictory to everything that I believe from, from, from research. And so, and I said, they were asking about keto and paleo and everything else like that. And so, and I said, you know, I'll tell you, 
I find a lot of value as it relates to it because they, it starts you off by moving you away from the standard American diet. And it's hugely powerful. I said, because you know what? When you move away from the standard American diet, you're going to start to see beneficial changes. You're going to lose weight. You're going to start seeing slight improvements in some of the metabolic profile from you losing weight. I said, but here's the catch. You have to ask yourself, what question are you asking in this moment? Is your ultimate question for losing weight or is your ultimate question, what can I do to invest the biggest yield return on investment to, for my health, for my dietary approach in terms of overall, then that's a di- that may be a different question may lead you down a different pathway. And it's up to you if you want me to share with you what my knowledge base is uh, on that. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating you say that because if you focus on weight, you only get weight. If you focus on health, you get health, weight, improvements in dementia, improvements yes. in depression, improvements in how you look. You don't regrow your hair, but everything <laughs> else gets better. That's so right. That's focus right. Focus on health, not the outcome. It's the process, not the outcome. I love yes. that. So, so tell me, you know, I, I understand you're involved in this really amazing um, project and you are also writing a book, which I'm really excited about. I don't know if you want to share some details about <laughs> that. I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. But, you know, this, this project of yours, which I find it fascinating, I find it that there's an incredible need to talk about it, and there's an incredible need to inform people on all of this stuff. So tell me a little bit about the Slave Food Project, how it came about, what was your sort of thought process, what is the work you're doing, the community, amazing community involvement that you have with it. Tell us about it. Yeah, no, I'd love to. And I will prime you with a question I will ask you after I'm done, right? So my question I have for you to ponder is what was your first reaction when you heard the word, uh, the, the slave food and for the series. Now I'll tell you kind of how it began. So one of the vestiges is that when I decided that I was going to get engaged in, in adding to my repertoire of, of treatments for patients lifestyle, I realized quickly that I was kind of giving a cookie cutter. I was forcing folks to kind of fit into a particular area based on the information I was giving, some of which resonate with them. Others, they kind of looked at me like, no, <laughs> they're nodding and saying something different, right? And so I realized quickly that I wanted something that was culturally specific, right? That was specific to my, my South Asians, that was spe- specific to my indigenous um, population, that was specific to my Hispanic Latino population, to my African American population. And I knew I always wanted to do, to do that. And as I began to, in my short time with patients, and we're fortunate within Kaiser Permanente to be able to have perhaps as specialists a little bit more time than our colleagues on the outside to spend with patients, but it still is awfully small. And so I recognized that I needed to give patients information. So I start off by giving books, probably 10% read the books. They were reading the books. Now it's not, I'm not saying desire, but they just said, Columbus, these are boring books. I'm not going to read it. Maybe that's what they said in their head. So then I started thinking, okay, maybe it's more visual. Our society has shifted. They want information that's delivered to them in slightly different fashion. And so as we began this process, then I, I, matched, I, I reconnected with an old friend of mine who has his doctorate in public health and is a, is a medical doctor as well over urgent care. And we began, that's how really this platform evolved. And we started looking at not only the aspects of of, of stress and the social determinants of health and looking specifically at what causes the disparities, looking at disparities. And that we chose first the African-American population, not just because I'm African-American, but because this is, the, this is the population that is the most desperate in the country. Now, 2020 just revealed this, but this is something that's been going on for, for decades that we've, we've known about the disparities in health outcomes and the poor health outcomes. And, and the question really begs to why. And so as we began to do this, and what was so interesting was that we had, I went to historically black college and university, which has gotten a lot of buzz since the vice president, the newly uh, vice president's in the office. And so we had a dinner probably about five, six years ago, my wife had, and around the table, we had all of these lawyers and doctors, all who graduated from there. We're talking. All of a sudden, one of my, my old college, uh, friends was a lawyer. He said, what's the deal with Black people? We all kind of turned around and looked at him. And he said, why in my practice, none of the white guys or Jewish guys get told that they have to have 
a prostate check and get that done. You know, how humiliating is that? Or have to get a colonoscopy, but I have to get it done earlier than they do. What's the deal with that? And that really was the, 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 the springboard for the concept of slave food. And as we, we began to discuss what are we going to call it, all of a sudden, uh, my colleague, he said, slave food. And I was like, uh, I don't know. I, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of consternation. But as I started, I started thinking about it more and more, I was like, yes. And here's the reason why, for those of you who have not watched any of the segments on slave food or anything else that are on YouTube and so forth, um, that we're doing as part of a nonprofit and other uh, uh, avenues, is that this is looking at the intersection between stress, discrimination, and nutritional stress and its role in creating health disparities. But here's the thing, most people think only of the historical connotation of slave food, but we talk about how we're enslaved to our environment. We spoke about growing up in Gardena and Compton, and you spoke, you spoke wonderfully in reflection on the fact of describing for folks, essentially a food apartheid state. Some call that a food desert or a food, a food swamp where you have an overabundance, a food swamp is an overabundance of nutritionally poor calorie dense foods. Food swamps, excuse me, food deserts on the other hand is an absence of health promoting foods. And so we know that grocers can, can set the, 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 the prices of the vegetables and things of that nature that may differ. And so we know there's poor quality vegetables and fruits inside many of these underserved areas and higher quality, lower price and more affluent areas. And so living in these environments that now you also have government subsidies, which play a role inside of some of the fast food establishments and bodegas and the foods that are sold there, as well as it's been well reported, the disproportionate level of advertisement in communities of color for things like this as well as you look at for subsidies for those who are financially distraught, reliant on SNAP and on WIC and their use of many of these same food substances that lead to their demise. And so as we begin to look at this, is there really a choice? Do I really have a choice when I'm living in these crucibles of conflict and now that's all around me? Are five burgers for a dollar and, and everything else? that I, I have because of historical redlining and other aspects that now I'm taking a bus and I am limited with number of groceries I can carry, that even there were even restraints on using things like delivering groceries if you had WIC before. So all of these limitations that play a role and lay the foundation, uh, revealing that to individuals that there's a, it doesn't eliminate personal responsibility, but it's giving an overriding explanation as to things that have been laid um, that may lend itself towards this idea of health disparities. The last thing I'm going to say that I'm gonna, I, want, want, I want your thoughts on it is there was a great movie back in the day called Trading Places. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, right? Trading Places. So Trading Places, for those of you who haven't seen, seen it, it had, it had Eddie Murphy, a young Eddie Murphy, and a young Dan Aykroyd. And what these brothers, these billionaire brothers decided to do is they said, I'm gonna bet you Mortimer a dollar that I can basically shift the outcome of a person's life by, life by changing their circumstances. And they demonstrated this through humor, through laughter inside of this movie, but is a reflection of society and what we really are faced with. We're faced with we're looking at people and saying, why don't you do better? But they're giving them a situation which is very hard to succeed. And they're living sicker and dying sooner than everyone else. And so that was really the, that's where we're, we're impassioned in delivering the message slightly different than perhaps has been delivered out there in telling more details in terms of a historical connotation, uh, uh, socioeconomic and beyond social determinants of health, political determinants of health. Beyond political determinants of health, a moral determinant of health that is lacking nationally to really change the model and the outcomes. Wow, wow. It's such a fascinating area to study. And I, I tell you, you know, I've seen so many people and yes, you can be the hardest worker in the world, but when you create so many obstacles and the person doesn't even know what lies on the other side, it makes it so difficult. So kudos to you for looking at this and looking at a way of thinking that will help people to understand how many biases exist. It's so simple to say, you know, so-and-so group eats fast food and that's why they have high blood pressure because yada, yada, yada. 
what causes them to eat fast food in the first place? Did you realize that they're working three jobs to put food on the table? And in those three jobs, the only access they have to food may be the one that only costs a dollar or less, because if they spend more, they're taking food away from the children. You know, I'm sure you come from a family where your parents sacrifice so much. And I can tell you, you know, my parents did. I mean, the stuff that they did for us to be able to have that chance is them literally losing years and years off their life. Yes. Yes. And both of us, you and I, we owe it not just to our parents, but to so many others around us that we're blessed that we have this opportunity, this talent, this skill to be able to share with people. And now we're both in a position where we can give back. Yes. You know, it's not the life that we make for ourselves. It's a life that we create for others. That's the impact in the world. That's the stuff that our children will see. Mine are only four and eight. I heard yours are a little <laughs> bit older, but you know, yes. I got two daughters and I tell you, you know, every time I, I talk about nutrition and I tell them what I do and they ask me, I try to share why I'm doing what I'm doing. Why is daddy waking up at 4.30 every day to write articles and do nutrition and do research and stuff? It's because that's how I know how to give back. And that's how I know you know how to give back. So, so what is this book that you're working on, if you don't mind? <laughs> well, 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 first I have to ask you. So what, yes. what were your thoughts when you first heard slave food? So, okay. What, so, you know, I, cause I get, I get a ton of response yeah. usually from folks and, uh, and it, it varies until they listen right. or until they, they have an opportunity to have me explain it. I had no idea. I hadn't looked at any of the stuff. I heard the name. And immediately I started thinking of the research. So, <laughs> <laughs> so here I'm thinking, you know, the addictive nature of food. So essentially whatever food is highly absorbable, of course, that causes the best spikes and so forth that's loaded in salt, sugar, and food, it has such an addictive nature to it. So my mind immediately went to the science and said, you know, this is all going to be about the addiction to food and how a lot of it is it's not so much even that it's in our control, that it's just the environment that we're in. And as a result of it, that essentially addictive nature of it then turns into habits that are so ingrained that we can't break them. And we essentially become slaves to the environment and the food that we have. That's how my mind went, because it was all from love the Love it, love it. Look at that, look at that, man. I'm gonna tell you, that's why we're brothers from another mother right there. <laughs> <laughs> you got it right away. And even then, I'm gonna tell you, that was so value add because I even skipped over that when I was explaining slave food. I didn't even delve into the role of the food industry and in really crafting and making the food neural addictive and the research that's been shown that resonates that effect and the excessive amounts that are located in certain areas compared to others. Um, so no, that, no, I, I, I appreciate that. It's, it's interesting. I'll, I'll have probably the top 1% we'll, we'll jump immediately to, somehow knowing di directly what we're speaking about. Others look at, at face value and, uh, and will question for a moment. And then, they, and then once they hear it, they're, they're, they're sold as it relates to it. It's, it's, it's a fascinating concept. And you know, it's interesting. There's so many things historically that have been done that we don't think about. So this concept that you explained of waiting 30 minutes and then deciding to eat the food if you really want to eat it. You know, there's all these things. So the new terminology, what the hip kids are calling these days is this concept of intuitive eating. But in Okinawa, Japan, they had this concept way back when, and their concept of harahachibu was this mm -hmm. idea of eating till you're about 80% full, right? Yep. But they, the way they looked at food was very different. There was respect towards food. Food was a way of common bonds. It was social. It was around love and it was around caring and it was around connections and sharing. Those things were what food was about. Now we're in a situation where food is about filling the emptiness that we feel from so yes. yes, The connections that we have lost, yes. the sadness that we have in our yes. hearts. The fact that if you say hello to somebody, how are you? You're not ever expecting them to say, my life <laughs> sucks. What you're expecting them to say, I'm good and walk away. Yes. These connections and these emptiness and with all of like the phones and the tablets, we become more and more distant yes. from just human touch and human connection. So that's yes. why I, I just, to me, 
the idea of slave food and the way you're looking at it is not just as food, it's political, it's socioeconomic, it's the social determinants of health, which really end up defining who you are in so many different ways. And if we can do anything to help people break those chains, break those mindsets, break those areas, it will make such a difference in our lives and for every single generation after. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. We say, my colleague actually developed this. We, we have equations in there. So I have my equation, he has his equation, we use each other's. And so his equation is stress equals demands minus resources. Stress equals demands minus resources. So when the individual feels that their resources are lacking, demands are high, they feel this sense of stress. And so oftentimes what they try and do is they try and fill these resources with fake resources, with food. They turn to food and other aspects that are there to somehow thinking that will give them relief because the food has been crafted in such a way that it does give you a short surge of dopamine, a short surge of serotonin that gives you this sense, but it leaves you empty, wanting more. And you come back for more and more and more searching for that same feeling that you never can replicate and searching for that feeling of a void that will never be filled by no matter how many of whatever your thing is. Um, so there's so much power that's, that's there in this food and that level of, of bliss point <laughs> is a friendlier term than addiction, really. It's, but it really truly is that. And I'll tell you what resonated with me was years ago. So when I really shifted and crafted, so I've been vegetarian, I was vegetarian for years, really more appropriately described as a junk fooditarian. And so when I really shifted to being much more intentional about my nutritional intake, I remember being at the grocery store, you know, and, and I had all this good stuff in there. And you know how the lines are at the grocery store. You know what surrounds the aisle of the checkout line. In that last moment, I turned and I grabbed my whatever that was on there and I put it on the conveyor belt. And the checkout clerk, I'll never forget it. I can still remember the lane in the person's face. He said, man, I thought you were the healthiest person I ever saw until I realized you're just like the rest of us as he scanned the candies I had purchased. I'll never forget that. And the power that it had over me, for me, despite my decision to do it, to eat healthily, despite my understanding and knowledge of the detrimental effect that it could have on me from repetitive uh, uses of it, right? Um, I still chose to purchase it. There's a control that's there. And so, and, and, you know, and it's a balance. And I understand in terms of not everyone has the same level of control as everyone else. You know, everyone's going to have their burdens and cross to bear in terms of things that they're able to be more tolerable and have small amounts and be fine and others less. But, you know, Sean, I use this as an analogy for patients in my clinic an awful lot is that when I'm treating a patient for whether it's heart failure, hypertension, whatever it may be, the dose I give one person is not the same as the dose I give another, uh, the second person. One person, the smallest dose, a half of the smallest dose may make, send them into an array of symptoms. And they're like, I can't tolerate this. And their body says they can't tolerate. Another patient, I give them the max dose and they still are like, I need to give a second and third medication to them. If we only have the same sort of barometer for food of knowing the ill effects of food in our body, and I would know the precise, through precision medicine, precision nutrition, the precise amount of whatever that junk food or pleasurable food that I can have that won't cause ill effects in my body. That would be phenomenal, but we're not there. So unfortunately, what happens is the fact that we're laying, we have the potential to lay the groundwork for disease that, that festers underneath the surface, that grows and heats until it boils over the top. And now we realize that that pot was actually scalding hot the whole time. And we never knew it. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's so interesting is, is that's exactly it. And when you're trying to influence people, how much does it take to influence somebody? Hmm. How little does it take? And sometimes you say the smallest thing and you find out you totally changed somebody's life. And then there are the others where you spend your whole life trying to change them and they can't change. I, uh, in nephrology, I think the saddest part of what I do is all of the sickest patients that are cardiology, that are oncology, you name a service, and their sickest patients eventually come to us. And every time, every week that I'm on call, 
I always have one or two patients that pass away. Nephrology is one of those devastating professions where you lose so many people. And you know, it's, it's the hardest thing is, is you always wonder on your patients and you ask yourself, could I have done something more to convince them of the right path? Could I have done something to change their life? Yeah. And it, it eats you up. And you know, some people aren't that attached to their patients. I'm the opposite. And, and this is like a psych issue with me because they're like my family. I get so attached. And I tell you, you know, when I was younger and I started at, at Kaiser Permanente, when a patient passed away, I would go to the funeral. I, I can't. It yeah. just, there's no way. I would be the last guy who's still crying there after the whole family. had, <laughs> And it was yes. just devastating to me. And I would come home and I tell my wife and I said, you know, I wish, I wish I had, you know, yelled at them. I wish I had done something different because if they had listened to me, but you know, those are the things, but you make the differences where you can, how you yes. can, when you can, and that's what you can do. So yes. What are you hoping with this project? What is the ultimate goal of yours? Ultimate goal, to be honest with you, is to reach more people than I can reach by doing a lecture in front of a thousand, a uh, hundred people. You know, we were traveling and we were giving a lecture in different cities across the United States over the past three or four years. What COVID did, the blessing in disguise, the silver lining, was that it forced us to go into the virtual world where now. You know, we've we've had up to 5,000 views in terms of some of the lectures and everything that we've done and the, the guests that have come on board. And so our reach is greater. And that's the ultimate goal is to reach someone where I can just change just one person, right? And so that reach to kind of hear something, if it resonates. You know, I, I described this. Now, I, I forget if I mentioned this to you or not. This message and this power of lifestyle, it can be wrapped. It's like telling them, it's like a movie. There's a bunch of different superhero movies. Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Black Panther. They're all good guys versus bad guys. There's some conflict, maybe a love interest. And in the end, the good guy wins unless there's a sequel, right? That's generally the, the script. And so the issue is, is the fact of how can we craft different movies appeal to different people? How can we really truly craft this message of hope, this message that's tied to wellness and the simple things of life to people that will resonate? And that's applicable, that they can go ahead and make a shift and a change um, to something better. So that's really the goal. The goal is to, to spur on, further spur on a grassroots effort, not about the standard American diet vegan style, not about standard American diet, uh, gluten-free style or whatever it is, but about eating real food, whole food, health promoting foods in their natural state as much as possible to augment your health. And that's really the goal is filling your plate up with as much as you can. Or I love the bowl method is what I espouse to many of my patients and, 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 and those who reach out to me. So, so tell me, where can people learn more about what you're doing? Is there a website, YouTube channel? Where, yeah. where can people find out more? Well, until the book comes out, <laughs> I'm working as much as I can between pract uh, clinical practice and fathering and other things like that. But, you know, we're on Facebook at Slave Food um, uh, is where you can find us on Facebook, on YouTube, Slave Food Project or slavefood.org.org. Um, the nonprofit that I am associated with, it's called My Healthy Heart, um, excuse me, Healthy Heart Nation. And it's myhhn.org. Um, and looking to really begin the process of, of being a factor in the change movement, right? And I always say, this is why it's such an honor to be in this battle with you. There's, I'm not sure what the new census will tell us, but there's roughly 320 million people in the United States. If 20%, if, if 64 million new, that still leaves an awful lot of people. That's more than enough work for all of us to do to get on this, in this battle, and to put up the fight and to craft a message that may resonate with people. So, yeah. Wow. All right. Final question. Yes. What would you say are your top three or four tips you would say that people watching can take away, start now towards the road, towards a healthy, heart healthy life? Yeah. What do you so start outside the kitchen. First thing I tell you to do is I encourage folks to take time for what, irrespective of your belief system, Prayer meditation, it's been shown to increase your prefrontal cortex and your thought process for your willpower and things that you want to do, a form of a keystone habit. I think the second thing that I encourage folks to do 
um, is to ensure that you not exercise that, that letter there, but but move, that you get neat with it. Non-exercise activity thermogenesis, that you're you're moving as much as possible is important to your to your body and to your well-being. If you can, as much outdoors as possible if you're in that environment. I think another thing that I recommend to folks is getting rest. There's power in rest. There's a level of trust that has to happen in rest because we always feel in this fast paced society that there's more that I need to do. And trusting that, that what I've done is good enough, right? And being satisfied is important. But what happens when you allow yourself to rest? The amount of neural connections that are made and, and, and the cognition and the hormonal balance that begins to take place that can help augment your desires to improve your health and well-being, especially as it relates to weight loss, is powerful. The next thing I would, I, the last thing I do is moving into the kitchen, excuse me, the next thing I do is, is hydration. I believe many of us walk around dehydrated, that we're, we're eating, we're drinking caffeinated beverages that cause us to lose. I'm going to speak to a nephrologist, trying to quote, throw out stuff to him, free water, right? Making us in this chronic dehydrated state, losing electrolytes and not replacing it, not replenishing it with hydration. That's valuable, right? So those are, are four things. And the next thing I do is I try, I challenge yourself to go ahead and see what green vegetables can you add? What colored uh, fruit can you have? Berries can you have? What beans can you have? What grains can you have? Be very intentional with that. Small amounts. I believe in small steps, atomic habits. You want something, the most actionable thing to do. So when you choose prayer meditation or deep breathing, choose for 30 seconds or a minute. I could do that. No problem, doc. Okay. Next thing, when you're choosing to sleep, you're like, I'm too busy. I can't sleep. Okay. Go to bed 10 minutes early. Just 10 minutes. Okay. I, I could do 10 minutes. Okay. You're going to do 10 minutes consistently. And, and every quarter you're going to increase it. Okay. You're going to get 40 minutes, right? Next thing you're going to do exercise, choose five minutes, three minutes to just do a little something walking with the food, choose something small and actionable. Then here's the last thing. Get yourself an old school calendar. Get yourself, again, not the phone, don't get this. Get an old school calendar, hang it up on your wall. I want you, I challenge you, whatever it is that you choose as your goal, put an X on that day every time you do it and you visually look at it. Your goal is not to miss more than two days in a row. If you can start to begin a sequence, you're not going to want to stop it. That's your reward. That's your reward is not to break the chain. You don't want to be the wink link. So I'd set your goal achievable and have something visual that you can go ahead and assign that, that allows you to understand that you're succeeding in this. I love it. I love it. Well, listen, I'm so grateful to you taking the time. I know how busy you are and for you to take the time to come on the show, share all of this incredible stuff. I can't wait for the book to come out. Thank you. Thank you. And guys, the show will be out and then uh, we will have all of the links for Dr. Batiste uh, down below. So please do support his work, do share. It's amazing work that he's doing. And once again, there is so much stuff that we can do. There's so much good. And what uh, Dr. Batiste talked about in his final Rex, that's the self-principle, sleep, exercise, love, and food. There you have it. Thank you. <laughs>